dreary day. The weather outside is frightful. Uh, but we're going to sing a Christmas song. Are you ready? It's Christmas week, so let's all stand and sing. song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold peace on the earth good will to men from heaven's all gracious king all right, stop. we're going to sing it in a different key now world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled and still their heavenly music floats or It's raining outside, it's, and people are gone, and I don't know, I just feel like curling up and go to sleep. How about you? So uh, here's a stack of all the visitors, all come up to see me today, uh, but we're going to sing for, Hark the Herald, how about that? Hark the Herald, angels sing. Oh, what? Oh, okay, deck the halls with boughs of holly. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. What is that? It was me. I had was that you? I thought, Lord, <laughs> Jesus, take me. Amen. That's all right with me. So are we gonna we can sing something. Go ahead, put it up there. We'll sing it. We'll try to sing. Leslie's gonna sing with it. All right, hark the hair. Is that is that a fat? Should it's we? Not very fat. It's all right, fat. let's do joy to the world. Go throw joy to the world. Joy to the world. Here we go. All right, here we go, brother Gary. of his love and wonders and wonders of his love. Hey, and that better? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Uh, let's pray real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the wonderful day. It's the Lord's day. Thank you for giving us Sundays to uh, come apart and worship. And Lord, thank you for this crowd of people. Uh, I know we're missing a whole lot of folks traveling and 
uh, not feeling well today. Thank you for our guests that have come in for the wedding. I do pray, Lord, you bless this day that if be anyone here that's not saved, not certain of their eternal state, that today would be the day they get saved. And Lord, the devil wouldn't hinder that. I pray, God, you rebuke him for Jesus' sake. And Lord, help us to sit in heavenly places this morning to enjoy the richness of your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for all that you're going to do. Bless uh, uh, the wedding uh, rehearsal tonight after church, and thank you for the wedding tomorrow. Uh, I pray, Lord, you'll give uh, Chris and Shelby many, many years of excitement and joy, and Lord, uh, blessings, I pray. Lord, we, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, anybody need a bulletin? If you didn't get a bulletin, raise your hand. We'll give you one. Uh, all right, it's good. To, uh, it's good paper to put chewing gum between too. So, uh, we'll go ahead and let's do this real quick. Uh, Sarah Young, God bless you. Raise your hand, Sarah. All right, you got your speech today. You're going to sing? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you are a guest of Shelby Hill already. A little premature, isn't it? A little premature. It's not yet, you know. Amen. Now you're just a friend, right? You're just a friend. You're not relatives anywhere, right? Uh, uh, and Tia, next right. God bless you. Uh, is that, how's your, how do you say your last name? Corby. Corby. God bless you. You spell that a lot too, don't you? I, I spell my last name a lot. Cor, Corby, K-O-R-A-B-E. Uh, ben, where's Ben? Ben, good to see Ben. Good to see you. You know, you know this guy next to you? You still here? Amen. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Alberta? Alberto. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's really, <laughs> it just look, kind of looked like a, 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 all right, okay. Jerry? All right, and the rest of the, these around. Gary, Jerry? Gary? You get it all the time, don't you? All the time. Gary J is G A. Bless his heart. Amen. And, and these three guys over here, are how, who are you related to? These guys? Are these your brothers? You got lots of brothers. Who's your, raise your hand if you're his brother. Go. Go ahead. <laughs> Amen. We're brother in Christ, right? God, well, God bless you for being here. I hope it will be an enjoy, in a time of enjoyment. Uh, we, uh, let's see, we don't, bulletins here. T the biggest thing on the agenda, of course, is service tonight. And then rehearsal will be here, to, will be after church, uh, you know, around 7 o'clock. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow evening at uh, 6.30, right? I'm just making sure. Just see, Chris is like, I don't know, I don't know. And he's like, how many of you groom, when you were a groom, you just said, I, just tell me where to go. You make, when you were a groom, you just said, okay, is that how, just say yes, ma'am, to her. Yes, dear, yes, dear. Uh, and then, of course, uh, candlelight service Christmas Eve, that's Thursday night. Uh, is that right? Hey, someone said they're expecting snow for Christmas. Leslie's praying for snow. Amen. Amen. Six o'clock uh, service. Uh, please bring family. We, uh, Chris and uh, Shelby, y'all going to be here? <laughs> I know you're not. I know you're not. Uh, appreciate church cleaners and yard maintenance. What can be done? Congratulations. Uh, if you um, money's great, gifts are fine. Right? Is that right? How it goes? Five days till Christmas. Uh, FBI class. Uh, spring semester starts in January. Uh, we do have a revival in January uh, 17th through the 20th with Brother Chuck. It's a, a hope for homes. And that's, uh, we need to make sure you get some families here. Amen. Uh, let's see, Jan Friday, January 15th is youth night. Uh, Joey, uh, Pastor, Brother Joey's bringing his youth down. Uh, let's see, Tuesday night workshops. And uh, we may, I may, uh, uh, depending on uh, attendance, I may adjust that because we have, um, January 5th or January 17th is our revival uh, that week. We'll miss it. We'll, we'll, I'll just talk more about it later. Our missionary of the week is Brother Murray. And Brother Murray's doing a fantastic job in Bolivia, South Carolina. As a matter of fact, he texted me this morning all the way from Bolivia. Uh, isn't that? I'm special, right? Amen. <clears throat> Although in here it says maybe Robert. I know it's Robert. He said, we're excited today. We're having our first service and baptism at the new property for Christmas. So uh, uh, in November, he said, one, right, one, uh, we write to you once again in great excitement what the Lord is doing here. What a pleasure uh, it has been uh, that he is allowed to be a part of. In October, the first church in Mon Monte Carmelo celebrated 
their second anniversary, it was encouraging to see all the people participating. They had special singers, guest preachers. The church has overcome a lot this year. Um, uh, very few churches last uh, more than two years. How about that? So they were shut down for seven months. Uh, the church has a new challenge to face this month. When we turned the church over, we put a family in place uh, uh, to help the pastor Francisco. This family came from another church. The husband had prepared in Pablo College, had taught Sunday school for years and served for many years. He has been a great help to Monte uh, Carmelo. Our desire was to, to later work with him to start our next church. However, in October, he found out he had an aggressive type of leukemia. He passed away three, three weeks later. Don't know when you're going to die. Uh, um, Billy uh, Maxwell, is it? Uh, uh, Kathy Harton's uh, son-in-law, 43 years old, died. Um, he, had, he, he, he was on dialysis, but COVID uh, complicated it. Um, so uh, after much prayer and uh, planning and preparation, uh, we purchased property for our new church. The Lord worked a miracle. Uh, the land prices uh, in our area had gone up uh, since we had started the project. Uh, and so, uh, and I guess that's on, yeah, printed on a sticky paper, yeah, label. Uh, <laughs> so they, they started construction, I'm just abbreviating here, and, and they started their search, uh, church today. So that's awesome. He's planting churches in Bolivia, and uh, he's had lots of issues in COVID, but while during COVID, um, he, the, door, the Lord opened the door for him with the local police, for him to go into the local police and minister to the policemen and women, and he gave food and stuff too as well. So it was pretty pretty neat that God opened that door. Uh, ladies' Bible study starts again uh, January the 5th, beginning with all new Bible study in Psalms, which you can't beat that. Um, if you'd like to join us, uh, get a book, see Miss Susan for details. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll uh, be at, at the wedding tomorrow if you can. I know there are a lot of people out of town. Uh, but we do need to uh, support that wedding, right? Amen. Brother Farrell used to say another poor house is being made. So, uh, uh, And uh, let's see, what else am I thinking of? Uh, what else am I thinking of? Am I missing something? It's hot, I know that. Uh, it's 71, but man, this heat does good here, doesn't it? It really does. We're in First Timothy, and then we'll dismiss for Sunday school. We ready? All right, uh, which in his times he shall shew, uh, who is the blessed and only po uh, potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, who in mortality dwelling in the light which no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and glory. I charge them that are rich in this world, they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for them, themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to them, trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with the amen. Uh, and I can tell you this is, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, suffered this in our church where uh, people would start to study. They, they get excited and they'll start studying biblical things, but they have no discernment of what to study. And they'll get off either on the internet. I know there, one person told me that they, this person, they would believe the Bible, but then believe the world was flat and all this stuff and all those theories. I had a call from one guy years ago. He said, you know what? The devil's changed every Bible in the world. He has changed them. He has you know, miraculously changed every word. And, and, and he rattled off a few things. And what happens is if you're not, if you're not grounded in the book, the devil will deceive you for sure. Amen. And uh, another, another young man went off to college and he believed in, uh, got duped in believing open theism, which teaches that, you, uh, that God doesn't know everything and that God's learning like we are. And it messed him up big time. It, 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 but anyway, so uh, study the book. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. I, I uh, hope that you'll enjoy it. All right, we'll be dismissed with Sunday school. All you, uh, you can stay in here if you want to go to these certain classes of certain ages. I teach the teens in the back, uh, so we'll dismiss.
Yes, sir. Thank you, Billy. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Everything's one sided almost. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Everything's <laughs> tilting that way, Brother yes, Ken. Sir. That's all right. We're all family. Amen. Amen. We're a little early, I think. Eh, we're pretty much on time. Turn, if you would, to Exodus. Put your little piece of paper in Exodus 3. And then, being as it is the week of Christmas, turn to Luke 2. Luke 2. Exodus 3 and then Luke 2. Can everybody hear me? I can hear me. Everybody else hear me? Exodus 3 and Luke 2. We're going to jump around. We're going to be in a whole bunch of different places today, but we're going to start in Luke 2. So stick you a piece of paper in Exodus 3, and we're going to start off in an unusual place. Hi, Shelby. Miss Shelby. Miss Shelby's getting married. Anybody know that? I heard that through the grapevine. The, uh, amen. Brother Ken, you going to make it through? Yes, yeah. sir. It's going to be touchy. When my daughter got married, it was, it was touchy for me. I knew that. Does the name Charles Schultz, does that ring a bell with anybody? Charles Schultz? Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz in 1950, which I didn't realize it was that long ago, Charles Schultz created the Peanuts comic strip. Charles Schultz was asked in 1965. In the early 1960, the Peanuts uh, comic strip, Charlie Brown, Lucy, Snoopy, Linus, all those folks, Charles Schultz was asked by the CBS television network to create a Christmas special featuring Charlie Brown. And at that time, Peanuts, Charlie Brown was the most popular comic strip in America. So Schultz, by all accounts, was a devout Christian. And he told them that he would create the first Charlie Brown special. This was the first Charlie Brown special created for television. He said he would create it, but there was one requirement that Charles Schultz had. And that requirement was that it must tell the story of the birth of Jesus. The CBS executives and the production crew, the producers, scoffed and they tried to talk him out of the idea because religion in the early 1960s and even today, it was too controversial of a subject. They wanted to stay away from it. But at the time, because of the popularity of the Charlie Brown comic strip, uh, Schultz carried considerable weight. And he told the network, again, that he would not create the special unless it told the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. And Schultz eventually won out. And because of the persistence, because of the persistence of one Christian, because one Christian let his light so shine, for over 50 plus years, millions and millions and millions of people have heard the story of the meaning of Christmas. But if you don't watch closely, there's a, hidden, there's a hidden message within this little Christmas cartoon that we can easily miss. The central theme of the cartoon, A Charlie Brown Christmas, is Charlie Brown struggling with the commercialization of Christmas. It hadn't changed much since 1965 and his struggle with trying to remember or trying to get the feeling of what Christmas is really about. So Lucy, Lucy in an attempt to help Charlie Brown out, she asked him to direct the Christmas play at the local community center. But as Charlie Brown tries to corral the rest of the kids into practicing for the play, none of them seem to be too interested in Christmas either. They all have their own ideas on what the play and what Christmas should be about. Even Snoopy, 
even Snoopy, Charlie Brown's dog, is found decorating his doghouse in an attempt to win a cash prize for decorations in the neighborhood. So Charlie decides to go buy a Christmas tree. And he's going to use his Christmas tree to help the kids get the feeling of Christmas. But all the trees, when he goes to buy a Christmas tree, all the, tre all the trees are made out of aluminum, except for one tiny, scraggly little tree with about five limbs. And when Charlie Brown goes to pick it up, about three-fourths of the pine needles fall off the tree. But he buys the tree anyway. It's the only real tree on the lot. And he brings it back to the community center, and all the other children make fun of him, and they laugh at Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. But there's a secondary theme also in the cartoon. The secondary theme of the story is Lucy trying to get Linus. Remember Linus? Linus was the kid that drug around his security blanket every place he went. The secondary theme of the story is Lucy trying to get Linus to get rid of his security blanket because his security blanket was going to ruin the play because he drug it every place he went. Linus, an insecure little boy with his security blanket, that never ever leaves his hand throughout the entire cartoon. He drags the blanket everywhere he goes. Inside, he drags it outside in the snow. He wears it on his head as a headdress when he dresses up in the Christmas play. The blanket is Linus's place of comfort in a scary world. The blanket never leaves his grasp during the entire episode, up until one point. When the children laugh at Charlie Brown's Christmas tree in disgust, Charlie Brown cries out, can someone please tell me what Christmas is all about? Lioness, the little boy scared of the world, in need of his security blanket at all costs and at all times steps to the middle of the stage of the community center and asks for the stage lights to be turned on. Linus looks up into the spotlight that shines down into his face and Linus begins to speak and he speaks the words of Luke 2 verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And at the exact moment that Linus speaks the word, Fear not, he drops to the ground the one thing, that brings him comfort from the outside world. Because Linus knows, Charles Schultz, the Christian that wrote this cartoon, knows that the ultimate, the ultimate comfort from the outside world, the ultimate protection from the outside world has come and Linus continues to speak. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Then Linus turns, he walks off the stage, and he says, That is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And a little note here, Linus did pick his blanket back up before he left the stage. But later, one last time, he lays that blanket back down. He lays it down selfishly, and he lays it down as a gift 
of love, something we could all study in our life, not only at Christmas, but year-round. Now, if you want to see when that time was, you're just going to have to watch a Charlie Brown Christmas. Amen? I know you didn't get out of bed this morning and walk through the rain and come to church to, a, to do a deep dive spiritual study into a Charlie Brown Christmas. So what I want to look at, what we want to look at this morning is Luke 2 and verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore, afla- sore afraid. The glory of the Lord shone about them. It wasn't the glory of the angels that shone about them. It was the glory of the Lord that shone about them. Throughout biblical history, turn to Exodus 3. Exodus 3, verse 2. Throughout biblical history, one way God has made himself known to the world is through light. With, Moses's, with Moses, God presents uh, presence took the form of a fire in a bush that wasn't consumed. Chapter 3, verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of a fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So he he presents himself in the fire of a bush. Later, Moses turned to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verses 21. Later, Moses was only briefly allowed to see the back parts of God as God passed by. And the prophet's face shone brightly after this close, fleeting encounter. Exodus 33, verse 21. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, when my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of a rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now if you turn on over, and we'll look on down at Exodus 34, verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, from where we just read, When he came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses was not, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So again, God shows his presence to Moses. He shows his presence to the children of Israel through light. Then, let's turn back to Exodus 13. There's a well-known instance of the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the desert at night for 40 years. Exodus 13, verse 21. Everybody there, amen? amen? And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So it was a pillar of fire, but it gave them light. So again, God reveals himself to the people of Israel by night. Now let's turn over to Exodus 40. Exodus 40, verse 35. I said we're going to jump all over the place this morning. Lots of scriptures. Exodus 40, verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent. This is the tent of the congregation. Because the cloud abode there. That's the same cloud that we just read about. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is the same. This is the Shekinah glory of God. And if you go on over, we're not going to read there this morning, but if you go over into 1 Kings 8 and 10, it's the same Shekinah glory cloud that filled the temple in in, uh, King Solomon's uh, temple. I'll turn to Matthew. Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. Jesus himself, when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, he shone like the sun 
and his garment became white as light. In Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. So again, he uses light to show himself to his people. So is it any surprise? Is it any surprise that God chose a light in the sky to announce the arrival of the Messiah, God's one and only Son, here on earth? Emmanuel, God with us. For unto us a child is born. 100% man, but also 100% God. Many, many scientific scholars have tried to explain the star of Bethlehem the night of our Savior's birth. Was it a comet that pointed the Magi toward Jesus' location that night in the manger? Was the light in the sky that night an alignment of planets? We have one this month. We have one tomorrow night, actually. Amen. It was in, uh, there was a big article in the uh, local paper uh, just this week that uh, on December the 21st, Jupiter and Saturn will align at their closest instance since 1623. And it has been online, it has been in the local newspapers that possibly this could have been what happened on that night at Bethlehem all those years ago, that maybe two planets aligned up and that's what the wise men followed that night in Jerusalem to Jesus' birthplace all those 2,000 years ago? Or was the star that led the wise men really an explosion of a supernova, an exploding star? Men much smarter than I uh, look back through time and they pl plot the dates on ancient calendars. And they try to line those dates up with astronomical events of that time period. So much of that research depends on the exact timing of many historical events and the questions that follow along with those ancient timelines. How old was Jesus when the wise men arrived? We know, we know from Scripture that the wise men were not there on the night that Jesus was born. We'll talk about that a little bit here in a, little, in a, in a while. We've talked about it before. Jesus wasn't a baby. We know that. But was he, how old was he? Was he a year and a half? Was he two years old? Was he maybe three years old? We don't know for sure. When exactly did King Herod die? These are all historical things that tie back into when the Magi, when the wise men showed up or what happened in the sky that night of Jerusalem. The historic history of the time and the timing of the Magi revolve around Herod his life, and his death. So when exactly, when exactly did Herod die? Again, all this study of these, what happened that night in Jerusalem, revolve around Herod and his death. All the dates of the ancient calendars and the corresponding events in the ancient skies of Bethlehem revolve around these historical events. The explanation that all of these exceptionally smart individuals have pondered down through the years. Was it a comet? Was it an alignment of planets? Was it an exploding star in a far, far away galaxy? They may be very intelligent individuals, Brother Ken. They may have doctorates and studied in some of the most prestigious universities in the world. But one great shortcoming they all seem to have is the fact that they cannot read. Amen? Turn to Matthew 2. Because regardless of their research and the timing and all those questions that we just talked about, Matthew 2, verse 9. When they had heard the king, 
they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. So it says there that the star which the Magi had seen in the east went before them. So the star was, it went before them, it was moving. So the star was moving. And then it says, till it came and stood over where the young child was. So at some point it was moving, and then at another point it stood still. It stopped over where the young child was. So it was moving, and then, Miss Esther, it stopped. And again, just to go back and look at that, it says there too, young child. It doesn't say babe or baby, it says young child. So that's telling us that Jesus was at this point a young child, not a baby. Back to what we were talking about. It was a moving, and then at some point it stopped and stood still. Now I've told you all before, I grew up on the farm. My dad has told me when I was a kid that, Gary, you're not the sharpest shovel in the shed. And these other folks, they're very intelligent people. But I don't believe stars and comets and supernovas exploding stars move across the sky and just all of a sudden stop when they get to a certain location. I don't believe that that's the way the world works. Now, I say these people can't read. I think the problem is more that they just choose not to believe. They choose not to believe what's written in this book. Even though time after time after time after time the science in this book has been proven to be correct. People choose still not to believe. Now remembering back to the Old Testament, remember we just we, we read about the pillar of, of fire, the, the, the pillar of fire that led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. Remember back to the Old Testament, the this light or star, we'll, we'll call it a star because that's what the scripture calls it. It sounds a lot like the pillar of fire. Again, this is conjecture on my part. Or that pillar of light that led the Old Testament nation of Israel through the wilderness. Because did not that pillar of fire, it moved. When they camped, it stopped. And when they camped, it wasn't like they just camped overnight and then they left the next day. Sometimes they would stay in places for weeks or months. And then when the pillar moved, they moved with the pillar. So, again, conjecture on my part. But the pillar of fire moved, it stopped, and it started again, much like the star that led the wise men across the desert to where Jesus was born. And again, these wise men, it wasn't like this wasn't a two or three day trip. It could have been weeks or months that these wise men followed this star, this light. It was, it was a long, prolonged, it was a prolonged uh, travel. God had, God led Israel through the wilderness with this pillar of light. They had waited centuries for their Messiah to come. And God may very well have used that same pillar of light to show them his presence, but yet they couldn't see him. They couldn't see him for their own sin. Turn to John 1, please. John 1, verse 11. Again, they had been waiting for their Messiah for thousands of years. John 1, verse 11. I'm going to read down through verse 13. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. We read these verses, 
and see it as talking about Jesus the Christ in his adult life, being rejected and beaten and crucified by the Jewish people. But on that first Christmas morning, realizing again that the wise men weren't there that first Christmas morning, but there had been a light in the sky for some time. Just something for us to think about. If the wise men saw the star, then it seems to reason that there would have been many, many others that would also have seen that same light in the sky. It wasn't a secret signal that was only seen by the Magi. It was a light or a star that anyone could have tilted their head back and looked up into the night sky and seen with their own two eyes. Anyone who saw the light could have followed that same star. But only the non-Jewish wise men chose to follow God's light. With all the Jewish nation of Israel all about the city of Bethlehem that night, Jerusalem itself is only about six miles north of Bethlehem. All the city of Jerusalem could easily have seen that same light. But only the Magi, only the Magi came. Again, reading John 1 and 11, looking at it from a different angle now. He came into his own on that first Christmas, and his own received him not. God revealed his son to the Magi and the wise men, a group of Gentiles, who packed up their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they followed God's light. How many? How many Magi were there? We've talked about this more times than a few. I criticized the scholars for not being able to read when it came to them studying the star in the sky that moves and then mysteriously stops over where Jesus was born. But most of the time, I'm not a whole lot better than what they were, these scholars, when it comes to reading. Whenever I get into a discussion with people about reading the Bible, reading what the Bible says, and not what I think it says, this is the story that I generally go to, the story about the three wise men. Because everyone, just about everyone, knows the story of the three wise men. But again, the number three has been ingrained in our minds. But nowhere in Scripture does it say that there were three wise men. The Bible tells us that there were wise men. So there were at least two. But nowhere does it say three. That has been passed down from the fact that there were three gifts for the young child. Again, a young child, not a baby. But it, again, it goes back just to the fact that there were three gifts. There could have been two. There could have been 200 for all we know. But we don't, there, we don't know that there were three wise men. So I criticize the scholars for not being able to read. But at the same time, one of the hardest things for me to do, one of the hardest things for Gary to do as I study is to read what the Bible actually says and not read what I think it says. I fall into that trap on a daily basis. We need to take the time as we read to read what the book actually says. Take the time to read what it says. Sometimes I get in such a hurry reading through that I don't read what the words actually say. Now going back, others, others in Israel must have had to have seen that light. But for whatever reason, they chose not to follow. But again, can we blame them? Looking back, 
we would like to think, I would like to think, that Gary would have made a better choice. I've talked before in Sunday school class about those crazy Jews. We look back at this book and we say, those crazy Jews, how could they not have seen with our 2020 backwards vision? But we have the same choice in our world today. People have a choice to follow that same light. The same light that is Jesus Christ. But how many choose to ignore the light in our world today? Too often we get a small glimpse of the light, but we choose to ignore it. We tell ourselves we're just not sure. We tell ourselves not today. We tell ourselves, I'll do it later. I'll do it when I'm a little older. I'll do it on my deathbed. That's when I'll accept the light. We want everything spelled out for us. We want to know exactly what, what's going on. We don't want to start off with just a small beam of light, just what God wants us to know at this point in our life. God doesn't always shine a giant beam for us. He just gives us a little ribbon of light. We want God to start us off with a complete glow of the sun instead of just that little stream of light. But God doesn't always reveal His whole plan for us. Sometimes He just wants us to have a little faith. Sometimes God just wants us to have a little trust in Him. The Magi the wise men, when they first saw that star that first night and they looked up in the sky and they saw that star shining in the east, when they first saw that star, they had no idea where they were going, no clue. They had no clue how long the trip was going to be. They weren't even Jews. But they knew, they knew that the light meant that a king was born. They packed up their most valuable treasures to give to the new king. Treasures of gold, treasures of frankincense, treasures of myrrh. We have the same choice today as the Magi had some 2,000 years ago. The light has come to earth in the form of that same baby, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. God reveals Himself as light. He announced His coming in fleshly form, in the form of light, a star, that traveled across the night sky and stopped over where Jesus was born. Jesus, the Christ, is the light in the here and now. Amen. John 8 and 12 says, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. But none saw him for who he really was, the Christ. We are in the same place in our world today. Some say that Jesus was a good man. Some look back and say He was a prophet. But too many, too many don't see Jesus Christ as the Savior of mankind. Too many in our world today don't see Jesus Christ as the light of the world. The wise men saw the light in the sky and they brought their most valuable gifts to Jesus. We have, we have seen that same light. We have heard, we've heard his word preached. We have read the teachings of Jesus Christ in our King James Bible. The question is, are we like the wise men? 
Or are we like everyone else? Are we like the Jews that same night in Israel who saw that same star but chose not to move? Do we see the light and say, oh well, just another miracle, just another light in a dark, dark sky, just another light in a dark world? Or, or do we follow the light? Do we pack up our most valuable gift and follow the light no matter how far or no matter where that where it may lead us in our life but you say brother Gary I have nothing of value to give I have no gold I have no sweet smelling incense I have nothing that I can give that's worth anything Christ Christ doesn't want our gold. Christ doesn't want our frankincense. Christ doesn't want our myrrh. You possess something tens and tens of thousands more time valuable to God than incense and gold. The most valuable gift that you can give Christ, the gift he truly values above all else, is our hearts. For those of us that have accepted salvation, that light of the Holy Spirit lives within each and every one of us. We have accepted salvation. We have followed the light to a point where the Holy Spirit has brought us to a place of submission and subjection to God. The question is, now what do we do? Do we continue do we continue to follow the light? The light doesn't stand still. The light continues to move. Do we continue to follow the light? Or do we stop where we're at, happy in our location? Turn to Matthew, Matthew 5. We're told by Christ, Matthew 5 and 14, we're told by Christ that after he is gone, that we will we are to become the light. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world, that ye there, that's us Christians. Amen. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candlestick and put it under a bushel, but on a candle, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are to become the light on the candlestick. We are to become the lighted city on a hill. The light, the light that is God, the light that is Jesus Christ, the light that is the Holy Spirit is now our light to shine out to the world. A light that shines through our lives, a light that shines as a beacon to those that live in darkness. Do we as Christians, do we as true believers, do we continue and follow the light and in turn shine that light out from our lives to the world around us. That light, that light that was God's gift, that light was God's gift to the world on Christmas. Amen. My Christmas prayer, my Christmas prayer for all, is I pray that if you haven't seen the light that is Jesus Christ, I pray that you find that light. I pray that you accept that light. I pray that you accept the salvation of Jesus Christ before it's too late. Don't wait. Again, we spoke this morning of people 43 years old, bang, gone. You never know. You never know when your last day will be. Our days are numbered. I pray we find that light 
I pray that you accept that light, accept the light of Jesus Christ. And if you have found and accepted the light of Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life, I pray for us all, I pray for myself, that we continue to follow that light. I pray that I don't get stuck and stop someplace. I pray that we continue to follow that light wherever it takes us as far as God will take us. And if we ever struggle, and we will struggle as Christians, if we ever struggle, if we ever wonder what it's all about, Luke 2, verse 8, And there were, in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Because that, that Charlie Brown, is what Christmas is all about. Amen. Because that, my friends, is what life is all about. Brother Ken, would you pray for us, please? Amen. Got about 15 minutes. Merry Christmas, everybody.